Hello, I'm Pamela Ferdin, and I'm on the Ken Boxer Live Show on TVSB. Very lucky to proudly present Ken Boxer Live. From the American Riviera in Santa Barbara, California, it's Ken Boxer Live, Santa Barbara's one and only entertainment talk show. Let's welcome the host of the show, Ken Boxer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Very nice. Thank you. What a warm, warm greeting. Thank you. I am Ken Boxer, and this is Ken Boxer Live. Great show we have for you tonight, as always. But let me make a few announcements. One I've been doing on a regular basis. Everyone in our audience will recognize who this is. Ellen, this is, I was just told before we went on the air, this is probably nine months now we've been trying to get you on our show. So um, if you're watching and we know you are only less than a mile away from us, that we, and I know you just moved to a new home in Montecito, and we'd like for you to come here. You know, we have 100 shows. This is our 96th show. We'd love to have you in the next few shows if we can. So everybody, let's give it up for Ellen if she can come. Thank you. I also, I don't know if you saw her, my daughter, my seven-year-old daughter, Dagny, was just on The Young and the Restless. I think we have a picture. Let me see if I can see on the monitor. We have a picture of Dagny on The Young and the Restless. And I'm so, so proud of my daughter on this show. And uh, let me just give her a hand for Dagny. Now, my daughter, as I said, was seven years old, and our, our guest tonight was a very famous child actress, probably one of the biggest, brightest stars when I was growing up. You could not uh, open up a magazine or um, watch a television show without seeing her. Our guest is a writer, she's an activist, and we have her here tonight. We have Pamela and Ferdin, everybody. Yes, and don't go away. We'll be back right after this with Pamela. Ken Boxer Live is brought to you by the following sponsors. Zodo's Bowling and Beyond and Z's Tap House for the best in family entertainment. Gustafson Dance, meeting the highest standards in dance training. The Eagle Inn, a family-owned hotel near the beach in Santa Barbara. And now, back to our show. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome back. Joining us this evening has been one of the most successful child actresses in Hollywood. There was a time when you couldn't turn on a television show without seeing our guest. She was a star on television and motion pictures, and later, later in life becoming an animal rights activist. Let's welcome to our show the very beautiful Pamela Ferdin, everybody. <laughs> I've wanted you to come on this show for such a long time. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Well, I'm glad you came. And I got to tell you, it's absolutely true, like in that introduction, your childhood was in front of a, tele in front of a camera, correct? Oh, definitely. Remember, we had three channels back then. So you are right. You couldn't turn on a, a sitcom or an episodic without seeing me. <laughs> so um, it was, you know, I started when I was three. My mother put me in the business when I was three. and. Um, for 10 years in the 70s, I was the busiest child actress ever. And two years of those 10 years, I was the busiest child and adult actress in that period of time. <laughs> so I did a lot of things. I, did, I, I think I did around 200 episodics, and they weren't just walk on roles. They were co-starring or starring, and then I did about 40 uh, voiceovers for animation, and then probably 300 commercials. You know, so if we I was listed, a lot. If we listed all your work, it would be the whole show, the entire show, <laughs> could be dedicated to that. But you said you started when you were three. Can you? 
give us uh, some background on how that, how you said your mom got you into it? Yes, my, my mother was a real stage mother. And she put me in a play when I was about two and a half, three, and I had a really good memory. So she would tell me the lines and I would repeat it after her. And um, somebody saw me in a play and suggested that my mom put me in the business. So, uh, yeah, I was three years old. Well, did you ever feel like you missed your childhood? Oh, definitely. I, I, I was working so much that, um, you know, my life was so interesting. I mean, I, I can now appreciate it. I couldn't earlier, but now when I see myself on reruns, I can look at myself and say, hey, I was pretty good. <laughs> but when you see yourself, does it, can you recall those moments or do you just see a, a person that's acting that you don't even remember that person? No, I remember. I remember a lot of stories. Oh my God, I have so many stories of what it was like to, to work with superstars. I mean, Jack Benny, Bing Crosby, Cary Grant. I mean, they all at that time, remember, during that period, there were only six studios and the actors, the stars, were contracted with one studio. So it was very much of a family kind of feeling, a community kind of feeling, which isn't the same today. But um, I remember, uh, in fact, I remember going to, they called it the commissary. And every studio would have this huge Art Deco um, restaurant. And that's where all the stars would go. And so when I was walking to a booth, I would pass Lucille Ball and I would pass Jack Benny. And I mean, it was incredible during those days. Did you ever get to go to public school during those early days? Or were you actually schooled in the studio? Well, when I was working, I was schooled, yeah, in the studio. Um, and when I wasn't working, which wasn't much, I would go back to school. But, you know, it was really difficult because um, when you're in and out of school, especially when you're young, the kids don't understand what's going on. And so they didn't accept me. They, they made fun of me. And, and it was very difficult, actually, going to public school. When did you go to public school? Um, How old were you? I was probably in public school really from the age of five. Okay, but you were, so you were already a star at that point. So everyone recognized you when you, did they treat you differently? They weren't very nice to me. Oh. <laughs> no, they weren't very nice. I don't know if it was jealousy or if it was just the fact that they couldn't understand why it was always coming and going. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it was really hard. Well, let's, you brought, we have some clips. Mm -hmm. okay. The first clip is a Star Trek clip. Describe what we're about to see. Oh my gosh. Um, the, we kids, there was a group of kids who were taken over by an evil alien. And we were beamed aboard the starship and we tried to take the starship over. And so finally, Captain Kirk, um, helped us see that we weren't evil, that we were good. Mm -hmm. And so because the evil alien lost his power, he kind of melted away and we became good kids again. So that was the, um, that was the premise. But um, I've got to tell you a little story about Star Trek, if I can. No, go ahead. Oh, um, love to hear it. I had such a crush on William Shatner. He was my very first crush. <laughs> <laughs> and I would... I would always watch him getting his makeup put on and I would hang out there and he would talk to me and he was very sweet and I'm sure he knew that I was a, a pest with a crush on him. And so he said, okay, Pammy, how about if we got engaged? And I said, oh, Mr. Chatner, I would love that. And he said, well, okay, and what day do you think we should get married? And I said, well, let's get married on June 15th because that's the start of summer and I don't have to go to school. <laughs> so he gave me a little cigar band and he was uh, very sweet. Uh, so I was thrilled. <laughs> Great. Well, that's a good lead and let's watch you and uh, Kurt, Captain Kurt. Without you children, he's nothing. The evil remains within him. I command you, I command you, to your post. Carry out your duties, or I will destroy you. You will be swept aside to make way for the strong. But now 
ugly he really is. Look at him. And don't be afraid. Death. Death to you all. Death to you all. Fantastic. Now, okay, when you see, yes, Pamela Ferdinand, everybody, when, when you see yourself with um, William Shatner there, did you know, I mean, you're so young at that point, did you know that that show it was only supposed to be on for about a year, right? That just has become this uh, phenomenon. I know. It's iconic. And I'll tell you, when I do Star Trek conventions, which I do sometimes, um, and everybody's dressed up like these, these uh, figures from Star Trek and from all the different episodes. Um, they came up to me and they said, do you know the chant you did on Star Trek, the kids? And I said, no. <laughs> and they knew it, uh, not me. I mean, they know all this stuff about me that I don't even know. And so um, it's, it's hail, hail, fire and snow. Call the angels, we will go far away, far to see, friendly angel come to me. <laughs> Very good. You memorized it now. Well, after I hear, heard it at these conventions from so many people. Do you go to any of the other conventions? Yeah, sometimes I do. I go to the Hollywood show sometimes and um, Chiller a few times. So yeah, and it's great to, to meet my fans it really is well you mentioned that you worked with some of the greats is there any besides um william shatner which was a great story any other story you'd like to share with us of one of the icons in the business that you worked with well i would say shirley mclean and dean martin they did a movie called what a way to go and i played their daughter and dean martin was so nice to me. Again, I would watch him put, have his makeup put on. I don't know why I was doing these things, but I just, and so I thought he was handsome. And so um, he would put me in his lap and he would tell me jokes and riddles. And yeah, it was, it was, it was really, you know, it was very interesting working with all these, all these stars. If you're looking back now, do you think like you, you missed anything though? I mean, you have, a lot of people, I'm sure, would look back at how envious they'd be of you. But you looking back, do you say, God, I wish I could have done something else if you could? Um, no, not really. Uh, you know, it took me years to uh, be able to really um, think back and enjoy the memories. Because I had a very difficult childhood. And um, a lot of it wasn't happy. A lot of it was... Uh, filled with sorrow and angst, and um, but finally, even in your I, personal life, right? Or in uh, in the studios, in my personal life, okay. um, with my mother. Okay. So um, it was. It was. Uh, now I can look at it and say, "Wow, I remember that," and I can remember the the interesting things and the great stories. So yeah, I. As a I child, you said you memorized a lot of things. You had you were good in memory. Um, do you remember uh, um, how, what your scripts were like when you were doing, like the Paul Lynn show, for instance? You worked with Paul Lynn. That was a weekly show. Right. What was that like? Um, well, it was interesting because um, it was in front of a, a live audience, and that was the time when they were bringing in live audiences to see these television sitcoms. And um, actually, the odd couple, when I did the odd couple, they taught me how to do um, a scene with an, a live audience, but yet the camera was right there. And you know, Tony Randall, who was wonderful, he was impeccably dressed all the time. He would sing operas. I mean, he was exactly like his character. But um, he would always say to me, Pamela, project project he would say i mean and you know jack klugman was exactly like his characters he'd come to work in jeans and looks like a slob and brought bagels and um and uh tony randall would be wearing these beautiful suits it was pretty interesting they were just like their characters well, you know, um when i told people that you were going to be on everybody talks about your appearance 
on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> That's this one show. And we have a clip <laughs> from that show. Can you lead us into this particular clip? Well, um, Jan didn't want to look like her two sisters anymore. So she got a brunette wig and she wore it to my birthday party. And when I saw it, I was so shocked and I started making fun of her. And, but then I apologized. The class bully, right? I, <laughs> but <laughs> then I apologized. Then. And, yes. But uh, you know, that's interesting too because my name in the episode was Lucy. And the writer of the, um, of the episode named the character Lucy because at the time I was playing Lucy on Peanuts. And so he liked Charlie Brown so much he named the character Lucy. Okay, well let's watch <laughs> you in The Brady Bunch. Pamela and Ferdinand, everybody. Peter. Hi, Lucy. Happy birthday. Thank you. Margie, Peter's here. Did you have to do that? Hi, Peter. <laughs> How are you? Where's Jan? Oh. Okay, everybody. Here's my sister, the new Jan Brady. Hi there. Happy birthday, Lucy. Hi, Margie. Hi. Jan. That's terrific. Thanks. That's the funniest joke you've ever played. <laughs> you really look funny. <laughs> hey, that'd be great for Halloween. <laughs> Halloween? Yeah, Halloween. <laughs> And like, you know, when you um, see that, the video that we just saw, uh, interestingly, in today's, you know, in the news about bullying, I kind of <laughs> precluded that before we saw this video. In this particular scene, if you will, you were kind of the bully, but then you came and apologized. Right. And that's something that uh, we could use more of today, <laughs> don't you think? Oh, definitely. But, you know, it's interesting because... I was such a, a, a nice, I really was such a nice kid that I didn't want to do any, um, any characters that were mean. And so I didn't really see myself as a bully. I saw myself as somebody that was just so shocked that she, um, I don't know, she was, she was making fun of her. But, um, but it's interesting because that leads me to um, Peanuts, Charlie Brown. You know, there were 50 little girls interviewed for the voice of Lucy. And we each got the same script, and each one of us were taken in one by one into a sound uh, booth, and we read the part. And I remember thinking that I didn't want to be just a brat, because I thought Lucy was just kind of a, just a, a brat. And I thought that I could do it in a different way where I didn't have to play a brat. Mm -hmm. So I thought that Lucy was precocious. I thought of her as just so precocious and that even though she gave Charlie Brown a hard time, she really liked Charlie Brown. And even though she uh, wasn't supposed to like Snoopy, she loved his kisses. So um, you have to, you have to give us a Lucy. Don't we want to hear Lucy's voice? <laughs> yeah. but can you give us Lucy? Yes, come on. Well, what I would can Lucy say, say, good right grief, now? Charlie Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the way I played it, I guess Charles Schultz liked it because a week later he called my agent and he said, um, I want her to play Lucy. And that was a blast, playing Lucy Van Pelt in Charlie Brown. Oh my God, that was fun. Okay, so now you're, you're rolling through your 20s and you decide actually to get out of the business. Yes. Why? Because in the 70s, the late 70s, uh, the studios were all broken up and um, there were all these production companies. And that was the time when they started um, using a lot of violence and sexuality in movies and even television. And it wasn't as wholesome as it was. I mean, it was just completely different. And so I didn't want to do nude scenes and I didn't want to do topless scenes. And so I thought, you know, 
the, the business isn't like it was, so maybe I should just, you know, go to college. And I, I wanted to meet friends because I never had friends. I was working so much, so I, I did that. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. did, now I may, may have got this wrong. Did you become a nurse? Yeah, I became okay, a nurse. That's okay. <laughs> and, uh, what, okay. And, and it was pretty funny because some of the patients that would come in, I remember one was in a car accident and I was starting an IV and he looked up at me and he said, weren't you that girl in the odd couple? <laughs> <laughs> so I got that a lot. Yeah, but you have so much material. Have you thought about writing a book? Oh, I have. You have? Yes. Is it uh, published already? Or? No, okay. that's, we're looking for a good literary agent. So if any of you know <laughs> of a good literary agent, please send them to my website and they can contact me at www.pamelinferdin.com. And um, yeah, it's a great book because it, it tells all the stories about the the golden age of Hollywood when I was working during those years. And um, and then, of course, it ends with my, my passion, the passion of my entire life, which is animal rights. And um, I just, I, I just feel that animals, they can't, they can't um, say anything to defend themselves. They can't communicate. And so they suffer and they're abused in silence. And it's just horrible. So I want people to understand that animals are precious and they're beautiful and they're kind. They just can't speak up for themselves. So I speak up for them. And yes, <laughs> obviously you do. But it has consequences, just like Jane Fonda. <laughs> you also were arrested twice. More than that. More than that? <laughs> <laughs> no, and Jane Fonda, I have to say, I give her a lot of credit. But, you know, she went to jail overnight. And um, I'm sure they stuck her in a, or put her in a, a cell that was very nice. Um, unlike me, which they stuck in these miserable cells and... I would always go on a hunger strike whenever I was arrested and put in jail. Wait, how many times have you been put in jail? Oh boy, probably, probably 10. Whoa, I didn't know <laughs> And that. each has a really interesting story, <laughs> so you'll have to read my book if I can get an agent. But, um, but anyway, um, I, I would go on a hunger strike. One was um, the circus. I was protesting against these poor animals that are in the circus that are forced and abused in order to do stupid tricks for an audience's momentary pleasure. And so the elephants are hit with a bull hook. It's a long wooden rod with a huge steel, um, steel sharp steel end. And they hit them uh, behind their knees and behind their ears, which are really sensitive in order to do these stupid tricks. And so I had a bull hook and I was holding it like this and the circus goers would come and some would ask me and a few even turned around and said, we can't go in, we can't support this, we can't be complicitous in this. So then a few minutes later, I was like bombarded with these cops and they arrested me and um, took me to jail and they charged me with a very weird um, statute that said you can't demonstrate with a wooden object greater than three quarters of an inch in diameter. <laughs> and this was an inch in diameter. So um, I, m I missed it by a quarter of an inch. But anyway, so, but I'll tell you, I, uh, I went on a hunger strike. I hunger striked for 10 days that time. And um, they had to let me out because by the 10th day, I, I was so weak and I couldn't sit up without feeling dizzy. And I think really the reason why they kicked me out of jail was because they just didn't want the hassle of having to bring me to an emergency room and, and everything. So, sure. but that was just one of my stories. I have many more. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to find out if you can share with us a, a few more of these stories. They're fascinating. Like. Vincent Price. What was it like to work with Vincent Price? Oh, he was great. He was kind. And, you know, it's interesting because maybe as a child, these stars are kinder to you. I don't know. But most stars were wonderful to me. And um, you, what about Clint Eastwood? 
You worked with Clint Eastwood. Oh, Clint Eastwood. Oh, yes. What movie was that? In The Beguiled. I co-starred. Uh, in The Beguiled, it was great. It took place during uh, the Civil War, supposedly. And um, there was a new version that came out. But I'm in, I think it was the 1973 version. But um, Clint Eastwood, in one scene, um, he was supposed to try and keep me quiet. And I was going to yell out because I saw something that scared me. And so he, in the script, it said for him to put his hand over my mouth. <laughs> but in the scene, he kissed me right on the lips. <laughs> How many takes? One. Oh, I do that. <laughs> because you can really tell I go like. Shocked? I'm like flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see that, by the way, on, I think, YouTube. I think that yes. clip. Yes. You can actually see you're getting kissed by Clint Eastwood. And you also, um, um, Jack Benny. You oh. worked with Jack Benny. Yeah, Jack Benny in the Texaco commercials, remember? When they had uh, the little girls in the, in the Texaco outfits and the little helmets and everything. And um, yeah, he was, he was great too. Do you miss acting? Um, I miss acting at the time I acted because, again, it was... You know, it was the studio system, and it was like a community. And remember, they only had, what, seven studios, and I would work at each studio. And nowadays, they work in all kinds of areas and, and buildings and whatever. They don't really work that much in stu at the studio lot. So, if, um, Well, if you were growing up today as a child, in the system that they have now. It's not that studio system that you were describing. Do you think you'd be as successful as you were if no. you were doing it today? No. For what reason, particularly? Because the golden age of Hollywood, which I caught the end of, and which I'm very, very thankful that I worked during that golden age of Hollywood, um, I think it was more wholesome. I think um, the parts were more conducive to my personality. And um, and yeah, I uh, I don't I think that I don't think that I would have done as well today. Well, I think you would have. <laughs> I think you would have. We only have like just a matter of like thirty seconds. Oh no! Tell us about <laughs> again um, the the book. Um, you need a publisher. You know, you ever thought of Amazon's a good publisher, right? Well, yeah, but I need a literary agent first ah, I see. because they get you to uh, get you in with a publisher. Got it, okay. Uh, good luck with that, and good luck with, with your life now and your activism, and Thank we're you. so delighted to have you. Everybody, Pamela Gordon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And visit, visit my website okay. and, and my Facebook. I have a Facebook page. We will. We, <laughs> everyone will. Well, that's our show for tonight. So for our guests, Pamela and Ferdinand, and for our director, J.P. Montalvo, and the entire KBI crew, I'm Ken Boxer, and good night, everybody. Thank you. Ken Boxer Live is brought to you by the following sponsors. Terry Riken, your broker with a personal touch for all your real estate needs. Gustafson Dance, meeting the highest standards in dance training. Spa Sia, the best in Santa Barbara for holistic facials, waxing, and massage. The Daily Grind, espresso, juice, and deli. Spud Nuts Donuts. Zoto's Bowling and Beyond and Z's Tap House for the best in family entertainment. Persona Wood-Fired Pizzeria. It's simply delicious. The Magic Castle Cabaret. Your one and only place to see magic in Santa Barbara. The Eagle Inn, a family-owned hotel near the beach in Santa Barbara. Petrini's Family Restaurant. La Quinta Inn and Suites. Country Catering, Meat Market and Deli. Lido's Takeout. Jack's Bagels and Bistro. The Ken Boxer Live musical theme composed and arranged by Mr. Michael J. Leslie. us at Ken Boxer Live, I'm Baron Ryan.
John Heron. Good night, everyone. Yeah.